Do I have to? Have you ever heard somebody start a question like that? Parents out there probably have some specific ones that come to mind. Or better yet, if we're being honest, you've asked such questions yourself. Now, as adults, we might find more clever ways to say it that don't sound so whiny, but we say it nonetheless. Do I have to do the laundry? Do I have to pick up my room? Do I have to go pick up my brother from soccer practice? Do I really have to finish my homework? Do I have to go to work today? Is there some way that we can make it so I don't have to go to church every Sunday? You've probably asked yourself those questions, if not out loud, at least in your own mind, fairly often. And that question indicates a time in which part of you knows something you ought to do, something you should do, and another part of you really doesn't want to do it. There's an internal battle going on, and it comes out in the wiggly, whiny question, do I have to? Now, this is the sort of question that the Pharisees level at Jesus today in Mark chapter 10, the sort of question that they are using to test Jesus because they think they're being quite clever. Now, before we get into the text, I want to do a quick aside. This text addresses a sensitive topic, a topic that brings about a lot of questions and worries and concerns and suffering for many people, whether it's you or people that you know, because it touches on the topic of marriage, divorce, and remarriage. However, the text itself is not actually about that. And so the focus of today's sermon won't go into those details because the text doesn't go into those details. However, like the disciples in the text, it will bring to mind questions about it. So I encourage you that if this is an area that causes you suffering, consternation, or doubt, please come talk to me about it. Reach out to me. Every situation needs to be dealt with on its own, and I wanted to just throw that out there so that if you have a question in the back of your mind, you have a place to go with it. Now getting back to what the text is really about. The Pharisees are putting Jesus to the task, and they specifically choose a topic which demands the sort of preamble I just gave. It's a sensitive topic, and there are people on opposing sides, and so they figure they're going to get Jesus into a no-win scenario. Whichever way He answers this question, they're thinking a group of people are going to be mad at Him, which is their goal. They're trying to trip Him up. So how does Jesus respond to this trickery? Well, as He does in all things, He uses even our own sinfulness to teach us good things. So He uses the trickery of the Pharisees to teach an even greater truth, a truth that is needed for the benefit of the people asking the question and for the benefit of the disciples who are observing this scenario and, through extension, our benefit. Now, they use a specific word when they ask Jesus this question. Notice they don't say, is it good? They say, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? That's intentional because they don't intend this to be a moral question. They know that many people are using the current legal loopholes to excuse something that a part of them probably knows shouldn't be excused. Now, Jesus knows the game they're playing. He knows what they're trying to get at, and so His response initially is to ask them, well, what did Moses command you? He doesn't say, what did God say? He says, what does Moses command you? And they come back with, well, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of divorce. Now, they're referring to a couple of places in the Old Testament. Deuteronomy 24 is the primary one, and then there's also Malachi 7. But Deuteronomy 24... Um, was at the time there were two main schools of thought. And Deuteronomy 24 said that a man could write a certificate of divorce if his wife, wife lost favor in his eyes because of some indecency, that he discovered some indecency. 
And there were two main schools of interpretation on what that meant. One was very rigid, and it was only sexual impurity, and the other one was very loose. There are even examples written of people arguing that what could constitute as indecency is that the meal that she prepared for him was not up to what he expected. So Jesus knows that this is going on and is kind of swirling around in the context this question has asked. So he asks, what does Moses command you? And then they give their response. But then he puts their response in its context. He says, Moses wrote you this because of your hardness of heart. He was allowed to make this command because of your hardness of heart. But from the beginning, it was not so. Right? So, Jesus begins now to contrast what men are saying is lawful versus what God intends from the beginning, what God intends from marriage. And He's beginning to teach them what I shared with the children, that they should not be asking this question. They should be asking the question, what does God want in my marriage? What does God want in marriage for me and for my spouse? But instead, they're asking, do I have to? Do I have to stay married? And they're trying to find a way out. Now, Jesus' ministry, not just in this instance, but in general, is all about restoring the understanding and revealing God's original intent for His relationship with man and creation, which is why He makes this contrast. We see this in many other places, but perhaps most famously in the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus uses this formula of, it is said, you have heard it said today, but truly I say to you, Right? In other words, what you're talking about right now is actually not what God intended, and I'm here to tell you what God intends. So what is Jesus doing here in Mark 10? He's calling out the Pharisees for asking this question, the question of what do I have to do? What's the sort of bare minimum that is legally allowed when it comes to marriage? They're not asking, what is it good to do? What is good to do? What does God want me to do? Now, if you've been here at Ascension for a little while, you've probably heard me talk about this sort of question is a bad question. And I say it's a bad question not because it speaks to someone's foolishness, but rather it speaks to a bad intent. I'll give you a few examples of ones that pastors hear quite often. Do I have to be baptized in order to be saved? Do I have to go to church in order to be saved? Not even do I have to go to church every week, it's do I have to just go to church in order to be saved? And I'm sure maybe you've heard these sorts of questions or maybe have pondered them and asked them yourself. These are bad questions. They're bad questions because their intent is almost always to thwart God's good intention, to find some way to wiggle out of what God says, usually for reasons that are selfish, just like the Pharisees. We want to preserve some sense of our control over our own life. We want to have an out because we're afraid. We want to have some control over the dialogue between us and God, so we want to hold on to some small section of our life that we fully decide on our own. So what is the answer to questions like this? Well, when I've answered the question, do I have to be baptized, the simple and short answer is yes. And the answer to that question when it's followed up with, well, why, is because God said so. He commanded baptism. And the effort to find a scenario where we could have someone be saved without baptism unless you are on the edge of earthly death, is always spoken in terms of a test of God, just like the Pharisees in our text today. The same with asking a pastor, do I have to go to church? Again, trying to find a way out for ourselves. 
But perhaps the thing that makes this foolish and really makes this a bad question is when you come to understand what God's intent is with all of these things, not only with His commands that He gives, but the gifts that He gives. You're trying to wiggle out of the greatest blessings in all of creation. It makes no sense. And we're turning away from God's joy and love and perfection given through the grace of God and Jesus to find our own way, to come up with our own rules. Since the Garden of Eden, that has got us only moving on the path towards destruction. So Jesus, when asked by the Pharisees, wants to set the record straight, not only for the benefit of His disciples and us, but also for the Pharisees who are blind and lost, demonstrated by this question they're asking. So if we were to rephrase it using the language I'm using in my sermon, the Pharisees are asking Jesus, do I have to remain married to my wife? Now, Mark spells out their motive, and so we know the intent behind this question. They are looking for legal loopholes. That's why they avoid moral language and say lawful instead of good. And they know they're controversial loopholes. They know there's disagreement, and that's part of their intent. To get Jesus to trip up, to get those who follow Him to have something against Him. But the question still remains, how do we make sense of the command that Moses gives which allows for divorce because of the hardness of heart, versus the intent of God, which Jesus spells out as clearly not intending such damage, such hurt, such fate. Well, first we'll look at the intent of God's law. Often, and and Paul wrestles with this, you'll get a, a glimpse of this in our Bible study on Romans after church today gets into this sort of dynamic that we think that we're tempted to think that the law itself is bad, which motivates us to try to get out of it. Whereas a person of faith understands that after they've been given the gift of faith, they understand that the law is actually a protection and a guide for how human beings are made to live. It is the fence around us that protects us from doing our own selves harm. That is God's intent, even with a law that speaks such harsh judgment on sinners. And then what is His intent for the gospel? The children spoke it so beautifully, that He wants to save us, that He loves us, that He wants to live with us forever. This is what Jesus is trying to teach the Pharisees and His disciples, that the intent of God from the beginning has been one and the same. He desires a relationship with you that lasts unto eternity. And the blessings that He's given out are all in support of that vision. It is for your flourishing and the flourishing of all people. Think of yourselves as sheep, an image that the Bible usually gives us, and you're hemmed in by a fenced sheep pen. But it happens that this sheep pen has all the good things needed inside of it. As sinful, wandering sheep, our propensity is to always push the boundaries and to reach for the things outside of our pen. Now, God is protecting us from dangers outside that we cannot see, and that is what is behind often the question, do I have to? Is a turning away from the gracious and good gifts and intent of God behind those gifts to search for our own, to to replace His intent with our own? So next time, dear friends in Christ, you start out by asking a question with the intent of wiggling out of some command of God or some blessing of God, do I have to? Let this text in Mark 10 come to mind. Let it remind you to reflect on why it is that you're asking that question, either asking it of yourself or asking it of someone else, kids to parents, husbands to wives and wives to husbands, a Christian to God. 
Those questions come so easily to us, don't they? Do I have to? Do you really mean, and all the way back to the Garden of Eden, did God really say? And they all touch on this deeper truth Jesus is teaching us today. God's intent from the beginning. The answer to the text demonstrates this particularly about the issue of marriage. God's intent from the beginning is that it is a blessing to you and to your spouse, that He intends it to be a lifelong blessing, the fruits of which He's about to share again in teaching with His disciples with children. So if you've ever, like me when you were younger, wondered what the connection between these verses were, it seems so jarring to go from such a heavy topic to children, well, here's your connection. They're a beautiful, visceral, creative picture of God's intent for the blessing He addresses on marriage. And of course, we can then relate to the disciples. They've been taught now three times, this will be the third time in the book of Mark, specifically with an image of a child, that Jesus loves children, that they're of great value in the kingdom of God, that they are a physical representation of His good and gracious intent for all people and the blessings that support them. His intent is peace, love, and joy which is why He takes them up in His arms and blesses them. So, dear friends in Christ, this love, this joy, this blessing, this peace, God intends for you, both in the commands He gives in His law and those promises of the gospel. It is is His intent with the blessing of marriage. It is His intent with the gifts of word and sacrament given here today. It is His intent with all good and gracious gifts and commands He gives to you to protect you, to love you, to bring you peace with God, joy in that relationship, because His intent from the beginning is He wants to live forever with you. Jesus' lesson today is that we ought not to intend or seek out an escape from His intent because it is an escape from protection, from mercy, and from love. He wants us, like the little children, to come to Him, to be in His arms, and receive His blessing. May it be so to you, as God intends. In the name of Jesus, amen.